So my first camera is going to be a Zeiss Contax 2A. Rangefinder. This particular version of it was made, I believe, in 1954. <clears throat> I sent Zeiss the serial number off of this and they sent me an email back and said they couldn't base it on that uh, serial number. So I sent them, they asked me for the the serial number of the lens, I sent them a photograph of the lens and they seemed to think it was 1954, so I'll take the word for it. <clears throat> so uh, let's start at the, at the top. Along the top we have a film rewind knob. It also has a like an ASA uh, note on it. ASA being ISO before that was switched to the international. <clears throat> ASA and ISO are the same, by the way. The, the settings would be the same, give you the same results. And on so on, the, on top of here, there's like a little reminder for what kind of film you have, although it only goes up to 200 ASA, so, you know, I'm not sure how great that is, but <clears throat> um, this is a rewind knob. There's a little arrow with, a, with an R on it right there. You can see that. Then this would be a cold shoe, but in the manual for these cameras, they called it the uh, finder shoe or viewfinder shoe. <clears throat> Let me show you what that's about. These cameras, uh, the, the contacts camera, this contacts camera doesn't have any way of identifying in the viewfinder what what lens you've got on it, so you don't know. How much of the viewfinder to use to compose your picture but they made these little auxiliary viewfinders this one's for the 50 and the 135 millimeter lenses <clears throat> it opens up and you put it in the finder shoe and i'm going to push it in all the way because it's hard to get out um, and anyway you have these the two little lights on the viewfinder window the the larger one would show you the uh, view field of view of the 50 millimeter and the smaller one would be for the 135 and there are other viewfinders you can get for various uh, different lenses if you have more than just two lenses I, I only have right now I only have the 50 and the 135 <clears throat> so that's the finder shoe then you've got the uh, shutter speed dial here, you lift it up, you turn it to change the shutter speed. And then you have the, the crank, the shutter knob, which is not a, not a lever in this camera, it's a, it's a knob. So you've got the shutter release on the top. And uh, if you use this camera, you can kind of get the hang of doing this to advance the filament to cock the shutter. And then on the top of the that winding knob, there's the frame counter. After you load the film, you set the counter to zero and it counts up. <coughs> so this uh, being the 2A, this was made from 1950 about until 61. And... Um, it was divided into two groups. The earlier ones, the cameras from 1950 to 1954, were what they call the black dial cameras. And uh, they didn't call it that. People call it that because the well, the shutter speeds were all black. Whereas this, uh, the color dial camera, you can see that the shutter speeds are black up to a 25th of a second. Then a 50th, which is the uh, sync speed, is a, is a 50th, which is yellow. And then the rest of the shutter speeds from 100th to uh, 1250th of a second is in red. Um, <clears throat> the earlier cameras uh, had didn't have a 1 second and a T setting on the shutter speed dial 
one thing that's interesting about this camera is that it goes from a 500th to a 1250th. And I think they, there was like maybe a bragging rights thing there where they wanted to have a shutter speed that was faster than a Leica, which this camera's made to compete with. But it's kind of weird because it goes one stop, one stop, one stop. When you get to 500, there's no 1,000th. It goes from a 500th right to 1250, which is a stop and a half. So that's kind of weird, but for what it's worth. Um, about the, the T and the B. B is, uh, as on most cameras, is for doing a long exposure. Uh, when you set the shutter dial, which you, again, you lift up and then you move it. When you set it on B, cock the shutter. When you release the shutter, it opens, the shutter opens, and then it stays open as long as you hold the shutter release down. And then when you release the shutter release, it, uh, it closes. So right now it's open. And as long as I hold it down, it will be open. And when I release it, the shutter closes. <clears throat> um, so why do they call it bulb? Well, I'll show you why. I never really knew this until recently. I looked it up. They call it bulb because of this. You can see this is a bulb. It's got air in it. And when you squeeze it, the little thingy shoots out. So this is like, it doesn't work, work real well, it's, I need to lubricate it or put some lighter fluid in there to get the goop out. But <clears throat> that basically works the way that the typical shuttle release you see these days works. One of these two doodads, where you press the plunger down and the gizmo pops out. So I'm going to cock the shutter. Gonna screw in the cable release to the top there. And then as long as I hold this button down, it's open now. As long as I hold it down, now when I release it, it closes. So obviously to take take uh, pictures at shutter speeds like that, you need to put the camera on a tripod. And uh, then it makes sense because if you do a time exposure like that with the shutter release, the camera's probably going to move, which you don't want, right? So the T setting on this camera, it works similarly, but not exactly the same. When you press the shutter release, it opens, then you can take your hand away and it's still open. And then it'll stay open until you move the shutter uh, dial towards the B and then it closes. Um, to me, it's kind of the same thing as if it's on B, which it is now. I'm going to advance the shutter. If I do one of these things, if I press this button down, now it's open. And then I turn this little knob and it stays open until I release the little knob. I turn it the other way and now it's closed. So that kind of does the same thing as the T, so but whatever. <clears throat> they were trying. Um, now, the, uh, moving on to the back of the camera, one thing that's a, about this camera that was a, an innovation of the two which preceded it is the arrangement of the viewfinder and the rangefinder. So let me show you another camera. This is a Zeiss Icon Iconta 524-2. This is a 6 by 9 centimeter uh, image on a on 120 film. As you can see, let me turn this around a little bit. You can see there are two windows on the front, and there's three windows on the front of this. And on the back of the Icon, the uh, contacts is one window there <clears throat> and on the back of this there's two one here and one here so this is the viewfinder 
and it goes right through to the viewfinder in the front. And these two are the rangefinder, and they pop up in here. So the way you use this camera is you'd be, you would focus here with the rangefinder where you have two images, and when they come together, they're in focus. And then you would compose and shoot through this window. So you got a, two windows to deal with. <clears throat> the, um, the Contax 2 was the first camera to combine the viewfinder and the rangefinder. So you got this one here is a viewfinder and a rangefinder, so it's doing double duty. And this one here is just a rangefinder. And then you only have one window to look through in the back. So you focus and shoot through this one viewfinder. So um, continuing in the back here, the um, on the 2A, the color dial 2A cameras, the sync cord here is attached point is a PC cord, a typical uh, you know, industry standard PC cable. Whereas the black dial camera had a proprietary uh, Zeiss connector in the back. So, you know, uh, that's one advantage of getting the, uh, the color dial camera is that PC cable connector. <laughs> the... Um, one of the things about this camera that's that's uh, interesting, or these old cameras are interesting. For instance, let me bring out that the Iconta again. There's no no place to attach a camera strap on this camera. It, you know, this little strap here is not much good. You you have to have it in your hand all the time. You can't like with a regular camera. You can put the strap around your neck, and you can have both hands free. This you, one hand is occupied holding it the whole time. So. Um, <clears throat> with the contacts camera, there's a kind of like you have two and two things in one. Let me move this just momentarily. This is the case for this camera, which is actually in pretty remarkable condition. A lot of these cameras you buy them, the case is all squashed. <clears throat> but as you can see, this camera has a strap attached to the case, and you can see it's sewn to the case here. Um, that's the same as the the Iconta camera. The case of this camera had the strap attached to the case. And a lot of times when you buy these cameras today, the strap is gone, long gone. So you, you got to jerry-rig something or, or get somebody to repair it, which can be expensive. But the Contax camera has the strap connected to the case, but it also has attach points here for a strap. Now, if you're gonna if you're gonna do that, I would suggest that if you go out and you buy a leather strap, I bought one on Amazon, a uh, leather strap for a different camera, not this one. But I didn't need these. But this basically, what they give you is, or they should give you, is these little gizmos that goes through there like that. Then there's a metal ring which hooks to that, and then the strap goes through the little slot, attaches to the ring. And then you don't scuff up the camera body uh, with the you know the end of the with this ring. Uh, a lot of these cameras, you'll buy them. They'll this area will be all scuffed up, and that's that's what that's from from not protecting them from a strap. So continuing on the front of the camera here, actually it was on the back of the camera. The bottom of the camera has the um, this little gizmos for opening the case. So you have one that goes one way and the other one goes the other way. I always get it wrong. And then the whole case comes off. Now, uh, these cameras have a removable take-up reel which can be a problem because if you lose these, you can't use the camera, you know. So you can get replacements of this, but they're pretty expensive. Although I have some of these from a Kiev camera, which is the part of Zeiss that was taken by the Russians and moved to Kiev after World War II. And um, they fit. They, so you can use those, and they're usually a little bit cheaper. They're more readily available. 
Uh, <clears throat> this is a focal plane shutter, and the focal plane shutter goes vertically. So there's, you can see the, let me change the shutter speed. I don't want to make it too fast. So you can see it operate. So it goes vertically. See that? And um, one of the advantages of the vertical focal plane shutter is that it, it's got less distance to travel. So that usually the sync speed is faster on these. Uh, it's 24 millimeters from the top to the bottom and 36 across. So it's going to take less time to go from the top to the bottom than from side to side. So I'm going to put this back in here, put it back together. Something about this camera was that there were two ways to load film in this camera. You could do it the way you normally do with a 35 millimeter roll of film where the, you put the canister here and you put it on the take up reel side and you uh, shoot to the end and then rewind. You press this button here. And then again, like I said before, this is the rewind dial. It's got the R with the arrow pointing that way. And you'd rewind it back into the film canister. But there was a second way of doing it, <clears throat> which works similar to the way that, uh, well, pretty much exactly the way almost that uh, roll film cameras work, like the Iconta camera would work that way. And how that works is that, I'll show you a picture. Here's my iPad. So you have a can here, then you have the take-up reel here, and then you have these two pieces of a can that you would fit together over the canister. So you'd put the film on the take-up reel, you put those two cans in, and you'd uh, you know, move them so that the opening is shut. And you put that on the take-up side, and the film goes from the, uh, from the film side to the take-up side, and then when you get to the end of the roll, you keep rolling just like you do with a, with a roll film camera. And you'd end up with the, all of the film on the take-up side in this can. You take the can out and you develop that. And, and uh, then, you know, you do the whole thing again when you go to take another roll. So you'd buy a series of these things and load them up with film. And you'd have the ones for the take-up side and away you go. And that looks like this when you put it on the camera. So you got a canister here. That's the film side. And here's the take-up side. And you can see there's a canister there. So it's interesting arrangement. I don't have any of those gizmos, so. Um, <clears throat> so I can't show you how what it looks like, but so getting back to this. Um, so that's the bottom of the camera. The, the uh, tripod socket here. A threaded tripod hole, just like normal. In the earlier cameras, they had a, it kind of was a foot that stuck out that the tripod hole was in. But I think because they were able to uh, shrink the size of the camera when the the, uh, the the two became the 2A in West Germany, the two kind of stayed the way it was in, in East Germany and Kiev cameras, um, they were able to move the hole back a little bit. It does stick out a little bit, but, you know, who's, who's asking? So then the, the business end of this camera would be the front end here. The only damage I found on this camera is that there's a little ding on the a little flat spot on the little lens cap for the 50. So the, uh, it's got an interesting mount because it's a, a double mount, if you will. <clears throat> the normal lenses fit on the inside of this mount and the uh, wide angle and telephoto lens fit on the outside. I'll show you how it works. Uh, <clears throat> let's start off with the focusing wheel here. This little knurled knob right here is the focusing wheel and then behind it there's a little sliding lever which is called the infinity lock lever. Right now the camera's on infinity lock, the lens won't focus, it won't move. But the the f-stop ring will move. When you press down the lever and then turn the knob, you can focus. As soon as it's out of infinity lock, you don't need to press the little lever down. But if you take a look at this little, the little 
button right there. You'd be able to see it move when I bring it into infinity again. You can see it click in place. You can hear it too. See that? My heat just went on, so if you hear noise, that's that's what's going on. So watch it. See that? <clears throat> so you can only take the lens off when it's in infinity lock. So it's in infinity lock now. There's a little spring, like a leaf spring thing like there, right there with a button on it. So you press that down and you turn the, the lens clockwise and it comes out. Now the normal lenses on this camera are, uh, they don't have a lens barrel with a movable lens. It doesn't move inside the lens at all. This is just like a little view, a little uh, uh, view camera lens or something. It's just a fixed lens. Um, you can see the there's the f-stop ring you can see the aperture opening up and closing it's very smooth and the so the bayonet for the normal lens is on the inside there's one right there one there and then one there and um, when you focus this the entire this thing is called a helical and the entire mount moves so I'm going to take it off infinity lock and you can see that the whole thing is moving and if I get it at the right angle you'll be able to see that it's moving out of course when you fo the closer you focus the lens the farther from the film plane it is so you can see it moving out and then you can see it moving back in right there and then it'll be back in infinity lock when that little lever comes back okay so now it's an infinity lock <coughs> So um, so when you put the uh, lens in, there's a little red dot right here, and there's a little red dot on a little piece that sticks out right there. I don't know if I can get it, so you can see it right there. So you line those two things up, sometimes a little fiddly to get it in there. Okay, and then you turn it. Turn it counterclockwise to lock it in place. The other thing about the infinity lock is that what I found is, is if when this when this is not an infinity lock and you're focusing it, if you go to try to change the f-stop, watch what happens. The whole thing changes. The whole thing. So the focusing changes. So I looked in the manual. It didn't say anything about it, but it seems to me like the way to use this camera is to have it in an infinity lock, set the f-stop. And then focus it, because then you don't take the chance. Like you can do something like this, where you press a finger up against it and then turn it. Yeah, you can do that. But you know, I, I, I think I prefer setting it first and then going and focusing. So um, that's the fifty. Now, <clears throat> uh, just a sidebar about normal. They call these things normal lenses. There's a couple of definitions that I've, I've read. One is that a normal lens is uh, magnification and the field of view is about the same as your, your eyes. So when you print out a picture taken with a normal lens, it's about the same as you would see with your eyeballs. Um, the other definition is that it's going to be approximately in the ballpark of the diagonal dimension of the film. So in the case of 35 millimeter film, which is 18 by uh, 24 by 36, the diagonal is about I think it's between 43 and 44 uh, millimeters, and um, so it's going to be around there someplace. But most cameras, uh, have, for years, came with a 50 millimeter lens, and they called it a normal lens. So this is a 50. So it's a normal lens. It fits in that inside bayonet on this mount. Then. For the case of a telephoto lens, which I have a 135, let me put this down. Let me take the lens cap off and rear lens cap. Hold on a second. 
So here's the 135. It's got a filter on it, so it looks a little different. It's got an adapter ring and a filter. Um, <clears throat> this lens does have a barrel that moves on and in, back and forth. And you can see that that is rotating inside there, which that doesn't do, the 50 doesn't do. And there's this little lever thing here, which is involved in you know putting it in place. So what you do is you have to line that thing up with the bottom of the lens. And now you can see on this camera here, this is a bayonet mount, this is a bayonet here, and this is a bayonet here. And those are on the outside of the helical, not the inside like the other one. So this goes, it kind of like goes on top of that whole works. And it's also a little difficult to press that lever down in order to get it to go. And then when you turn it, I didn't get it. There it goes. And then it clicks in place. So that's the 135. And now you can see that this is moving out and moving back in. And when you look through the rangefinder or the viewfinder on this camera, you can see it, it does move the helical on the inside so that the rangefinder does work. But again, you would have to use the one of these viewfinders in order to compose your shots and, and take your quick pictures. So let me take this one off. Do that by pressing that, turning it clockwise. And then I'm going to put the 50 back on. Again, you kind of got to. Actually, pardon me, it's got to be an infinity lock. You got to kind of hunt a little bit with the with these in order to get them to go in place. So again, that's the f-stop ring. And then the one last thing on the front of the camera here is this uh, cell timer. Let me get this out of the way. So you would cock the shutter, what am I on here, cock the shutter, and then this has got little de detents in it, so I think it's like 2, 4, 6, 8 seconds. So you go to one of the detents, you press the shutter release, and it fires. I uh, believe that you can't do self-timer can't use a self-timer on t and the 1250 i think i'm not sure there's a limitation on, on that I, I would have to look that up again so uh there's the contacts two-way <laughs>